What's the tea? Welcome everyone to Trust and Trade, your weekly glimpse into hot topics in the world of antitrust and consumer protection. Welcome to our podcast by the Trial Practice Committee of the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. My name is Yixing Wu, and today's topic is Minority Women Succeed as Antitrust Trial Lawyers. Here with me are two very experienced antitrust trial lawyers, Barbara Hart and Deborah Brooks. They will share their insights in and stories about how they become successful antitrust trial lawyers as a woman and as a minority woman. And first, let me briefly introduce the two speakers. Um, Barbara Hart is a principal at Grant and Eisenhofer. She has nearly three decades of experience as a leader in plaintiffs' antitrust litigation. She received her undergraduate degree from Vanderbilt University, master's degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and JD from the Fordham University School of Law, where she was a member of the Fordham Law Review. Barbara is also colleague counsel in an antitrust class action, representing a putative end user class of indirect purchasers, claiming that the county's major chemical manufacturers schemed to inflate the price of caustic soda. Besides, Barbara is a leader in the legal community. In 2020, she received the EPIQ award for the coalition's advocacy for the advancement of women. She currently serves on the Policy Reform and Reinvention Task Force, as well as a director on the Westchester Medical Center Foundation Board. She co-edited a New York Antitrust and Consumer Protection Law handbook. She's, a, she's on the New York CBAR Antitrust Executive Committee, where she served as the section chair in 2014. She has also successfully represented institutional investors as a Mica Curie on various matters, including on New York's Martin Act. Barbara has been selected for inclusion to the list of New York super lawyers for nine years. And so let me introduce our second speaker, uh, Deborah Brooks. Ms. Deborah Brooks is the Deputy Virtual Currency Chief in the Research and Innovation Division at New York State, New York State Department of Financial Services. Uh, Deborah has more than two decades exp experience of practicing antitrust law and consumer protection. She received her undergraduate degree and master's degree from New York University and JD from Albany Law School, where she graduated cum laude. Deborah was on Albany Law Review and served as its note and comment editor. Starting with DFS in 2013, Deborah investigates matters involving the enforcement of banking and insurance laws and regulations, and previously the enforcement of frauds committed against New York consumers who purchased harmful financial products, such as online payday loans. Currently, uh, Deborah is the Deputy Virtual Currency Chief in the Research and Innovation Division. Before joining DFS, Deborah was a white collar federal prosecutor with the United States Department of Justice Antitrust Division in New York, where she joined as an honors attorney. For over 14 years, Deborah investigated and prosecuted criminal antitrust violations, include bid rigging, price fixing, and customer allocation conspiracies, as well as other white collar criminal violations such as tax evasion and tax fraud. Dabra is a great leader and supporter of the minority women community. She currently serves as a board member and co-head of the Audit and Finance Community of Urban Bush Women, Inc., a nonprofit non dance company and the only professional of African-American women's dance company based in New York. Today, we're very glad that we have the wonderful opportunity to interview the two speakers and first, let's start with Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Good morning. <laughs> Hi. So first, so we just want to ask a few questions. And uh, thank you so much for sharing with your insights. And as the a woman, a minority, this issue is uh, very important to women and minority women. 
uh, who wants to practice antitrust law as a trial lawyer. So as a woman, uh, antitrust lawyer, what obstacles or stress have you encountered when uh, advancing your career and how did you successfully overcome these difficulties? Thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity to talk and it's lovely to see my dear friend Deborah. Um, I am a woman and not a minority uh, advocate, lawyer, um, so I have not had the challenges that are faced um, by uh, minority women lawyers, but I would say that uh, the issues related to being a woman in leadership in the law um, are not behind us. There are many challenges that one still encounters, most of which are in the rear view mirror for me, um, you know, as I've been practicing for 30 years. I have um, uniquely benefited from minority women in leadership who have given me opportunities um, such as Treasurer Denise Napier, who was the first uh, African-American woman elected statewide official, the treasurer of the state of Connecticut, who gave me an enormous opportunity in the waste management litigation. I think the, the lesson there for me is um, that you need to seek out opportunity for business. You need to see your career as a curated asset within your life and um, you need to to both be an ally to other women um, and minority women um, and give them a voice give them a platform whenever I've been asked to put together a panel I um, very decidedly lean towards and I know many talented men and uh, many talented men have mentored me or given me opportunity along the way but my pay it forward on that is if I'm putting together a panel or a team, I decidedly make a concerted effort to find talented women and give them a platform to showcase who they are, give them exposure and uh, reputation building opportunities. It's something that was afforded to me early in my career um, by Ed Labaton at my first firm and Steve Lowy at my second firm, I was given many speaking opportunities and lead counsel opportunities. Um, and I try to make that available and be an ally to other women. I think allies um, are very, very important in any negotiation and women need to foster that um, with women um, at their same level and women junior to them. And um, that can be uh, done by um, speaking up in support of uh, an opinion that another woman has uh, articulated at a meeting. Um, it can be reaching out to a woman who's going through a job transition, looking for a job or, um, you know, landed at a new job, which can be isolating. Um, there are a lot of ways to be allies and for women to foster a sense of strength and community and to have a bank of advisors um, that can you can call on uh, when you're going through a negotiation and you need another perspective. And uh, because as you advance, you will often be um, you know, one or one of few women in a situation, having women outside the immediate circle can be a tremendous asset. So I make conscious decisions to be an advocate for women an advocate for minority women. I have benefited from this um, and I commend it to others. We, we can isolate and we juggle so many things um, that it's really indispensable to one's mental health and advancement um, to cultivate allies and to make conscious decisions to um, keep a envelope of people around you that you trust and you look to that can identify with the experiences the you know I, I don't want to be cliche but the micro micro and macro aggressions that you experience routinely um, that you need to keep moving through uh, because they can really create uh, very big issues uh, for you and be very demoralizing it's important to have resources available for people that can um, keep you going and keep you strong and I'm, I, it, there's many joys to my career, and uh, I hope the same for others, but I don't want to diminish 
um, the fact that there's still much work to be done and how we uh, keep the strength to do that. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your insights. It's very important to be an ally for other women and your support. And then my next, next question is, uh, having been working in the private sector throughout your career, could you describe the current work environment and career advancement opportunities for women antitrust trial lawyers in private sector? Well, I think it's a tremendous uh, current environment for women um, to, a, to a certain extent. I think that many firms are under uh, pressure from clients and the larger world. The press is beginning to to actually get with it, um, and clients are, are uh, insisting upon uh, diverse teams, teams populated by women and minorities. Um, courts are also beginning to uh, assert their own prerogative to, to insist on staffing that reflects the population. Um, and so there is a real opportunity for for women, I think that, like so many of us, women need to get over um, their sense of being an imposter and um, prepare, do your homework, but believe in yourself that uh, the opportunities that are presented, you may not have all the solutions, you may not have all the skills, but plow ahead, grab the opportunity, and believe in your own problem solving capacity um, after you get and secure the opportunity. You need to. Um, trapeze forward to greater um, responsibilities. So you acquire skill sets over time. You should become a, a tremendous writer, uh, succinct and to the point, an effective writer, a great researcher. Um, but then you need to advance uh, the specter. And right now, um, you know, the uh, working environment is conducive to even greater isolation since, since so many of us are remote. So I was deeply touched when the senior women at my firm, Grant Eisenhofer, began uh, to have Zooms uh, just with the women in the firm. And that was collegial and nice and warm and welcoming and supportive. Um, and those types of initiatives that are informal and allow us to talk and, you know, let our hair down a bit um, are instrumental to a sense of um, not being alone and isolation. And I'm sure that's true more broadly than just women and minorities. But because women and minorities uh, face our own unique challenges at different points in life, I think it's quite important now. Um, but I, I do think women need to uh, get over fear of failure. When you fail and you will fail, you need to try to move through it as quickly as possible and get back on your feet. You can't do anything about what happened. You have to learn as much as you can from it, but it does not define you. It needs to be just a learning opportunity that you move through. Men keep getting up at bat. Women need to more readily do that and um, just chalk it up as not a um, measure of them but a measure of an incident, a circumstance. What do you learn? How do you go forward? And in order to do that, you need other women that are your champions and other people that have faith in you. And you need to carry forward. You need to keep going forward as whatever setback you face. That's true in life and it will be true in your career. And it has been true in my career. Um, and it's something that I've, I've really had to wrestle with and, uh, I think that um, sports are a great analogy because you do keep getting up at bat after you strike out. And so you need to know that you could make a hit, you could get a double or a single or a bunt next time up, and those are all perfectly productive up at bats. So you need to keep moving and not be defined by your last up at bat. Um, so those, those are thoughts. I think it's a very uniquely... Um, good job market for women and minority women um, right now. And you should certainly leverage that and reach for something that you might not feel completely prepared to do. You'll be, you'll be fine. You'll prepare. Women are known to do their homework and be very industrious and hardworking. And we are. 
Um, so we need to just have confidence and, and take our seat at the table. Yeah, I really like the analogy, like being a lawyer is like running a marathon. So once we just fell, we can just stand up and keep running until um, to a goal. That's great. Right. Right. So, yeah, because we are, I mean, as you mentioned, like women lawyer or male lawyers are industri industrials. And what extra efforts, um, uh, in addition now to doing fantastic work, I mean, have you done when advancing your career as a woman? Well, I had people ask me to co-author or to speak early on in my career, um, and I said yes. And I would say yes to publishing opportunities. You know, building, building a career and a reputation involves um, the hard work behind the scenes um, on brief writing and research and uh, being a strategic ally within um, your litigation team um, and acquiring those skills. But then there is the public facing aspects of what one needs to do. Um, so committee membership um, at the New York State Bar or the, the American Bar Association and publishing subcommittee involvement, um, professional involvement um, and taking on roles. But one needs not to just be the, um, you know, end up in kind of an administrative role where one doesn't create a profile. You need to speak up and uh, build your larger reputation. Um, and, you know, I know some people may be more shy or be um, disdainful of self-promotion, um, but uh, one needs to recognize that uh, poise and presence and outreach are uh, manifestly required to gain the faith of clients and your own leadership within whatever organization. And therefore, those are just as important skills to develop as are your writing and research skills if you want to advance. And, you know, I'm not saying that being you know, driven to a partnership or whatever leadership positions is for everyone. Um, you know, it can be a very happy life to have um, a set of expectations where you're the author or the, the writer and you do that with grace and talent. And that's, that's a great career. Um, but if you want to be leading a team or, um, you know, servicing clients, you need to create a sense of, stature within the legal community and that involves cultivating um reputationally all that uh you can to have people think of you in situations that you're someone that they uh want to put before a client or before a court and uh they observe you in meetings whether you take a seat at the table or whether you think that you should be a backbencher um they're 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 assessing you, you know, everything sadly is somewhat of a performance art and uh, you shouldn't overlook that or diminish that or, or scoff at that as, you know, a trivial to uh, who you are and how you are. So how we present ourselves, the words that we choose, um, the tone of voice, the commanding uh, behavior that we might take on in a meeting. Um, these are, are very important. I myself fall prey to apologizing often for having opinions um, and I can become, uh, you know, fawning and uh, behaviors where I am uh, seeking consensus in ways that undermine the strength of what I'm saying. And I try to be mindful of that. I don't think we can be a bull in a china shop about the way in which we go about um, trying to win allies and win our point. I don't think it helps to alienate people. I also don't think it helps, and, uh, and I wrestle with it, to um, apologize and uh, try to um, be too solicitous of everyone around you. You have to have the strength of conviction and stick to your guns uh, in terms of what you're saying but be prepared, have your backup, and don't expect everyone to agree with you immediately. 
Um, and when people do support you in an opinion, um, you know, thank them, make a point of, of cultivating people that are willing to stand with you and stand with them in turn, be cultivate allies and be an ally. I think it's a great time for opportunity for women and minorities um, because of the larger climate, the ESG initiatives that are uh, sweeping uh, public companies and boards. Um, these imperatives are real. And um, ideally, we can all help to push a real um, seismic change because um, clearly women and minorities are not represented in leadership and ownership at firms um, and in the world writ large. And uh, we need to push through this, this door and this opportunity. We need to seize it and large and small together. All right. Thank you so much, Barbara, for sharing like, your perspective from private sector. That's really encouraging. Yeah. And next, uh, that's just, uh, uh, I mean, let's shift our gear to public sector. So start with like, hi, Debra. Good morning. Thank you for having me this today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, your time to talk with us. So as a minority woman antitrust lawyer, I mean, same question, what obstacles uh, have you encountered when advancing your career? Well, thank you for asking the question. And I first, I feel like I must do the typical government disclaimer. The opinions I share here are my own and in no way reflect the opinions of the New York State Department of Financial Services. Um, with that, I think for me, my, my trajectory um, is different from Barbara's and noting that the antitrust bar is very small and, and it's almost minuscule for people of color and for women of color attorneys. Uh, to put it in perspective, when I joined the antitrust division, um, as an honors attorney in 1998, I was the only person of color attorney in an office of about 15 to 20 attorneys. And that really is a daunting um, perspective. And, you know, now today, the term imposter syndrome is bantered about, but I didn't know that term back then. And it really felt, um, I felt um, alone. And what was even more challenging was to have leadership that really didn't encourage, uh, at the time, uh, meaningful mentorship programs and even uh, identifying other people of, people of color attorneys within the division. Since I was in a field office, I was unaware that there were other attorneys of color within the division um, nationwide. So I really was alone and I felt I was on my own for at least the early years of, of my career there in the um, antitrust division. All right. So um, how did you overcome these uh, obstacles? Well, for me, the first step was, uh, thankfully, I study martial arts and I had a black belt. And sometimes the, the one thing you learn in Taekwondo is always be on the defensive. I mean, offensive, not defensive posture. So I really had to strike out. First, I had to find my own mentors since my agency at the time were not offering mentorship programs. And I remember the first mentor I met was a black woman, AUSA, uh, Tanya Hill in the Eastern District of New York. And we worked on a joint investigation involving bid rigging at auto, um, auto sales in, on the island, Long Island, New York. And it was, it was just a wonderful experience to reach out to her and, and really felt like asking those I call dumb questions or basic questions and you, I didn't feel comfortable asking my um, senior white colleagues because you just didn't know. Um, particularly when you're a black woman, all the stereotypes um, of a black woman precedes me and you don't feel, you, I never felt comfortable asking those questions because I didn't want the stereotype of being um, labeled uh, intellectually inferior, even though I graduated with three degrees, or actually four degrees, three of them from NYU graduated with honors, I felt that the stigma of the, the anti-intellectual Black woman would really come to bear. So I felt comfortable asking um, Tanya those really uncomfortable and 
what I thought to be dumb questions. Uh, second, I joined a lot of organizations. I first started with the Women's Antitrust Group. Um, I also joined an organization later called Corporate Council Women of Color, where I really learned how to navigate the white spaces, which I really didn't understand when I started, how to articulate my points, how to get um, my seat at the table, if you will, as Barbara mentioned. It was always a challenge to articulate your points, and you get pushed back, and you felt that, well, like you felt defeated, but I began to learn that it's okay to come back and argue your same point in different ways. And I started to do that um, over time. Going to these training sessions have always been a, a wonderful thing for me. And that's kind of like the third thing I did was go through as many training programs as the division would pay for and sponsor. I, that's how Barbara and I met through one of those um, training sessions many years ago. And Barbara became, uh, I feel, as my mentor over the years to give a perspective, uh, definitely from a woman and a trust to, to watch her confidently, gave me confidence to articulate my points. Um, and luckily, I was very fortunate where I was assigned to a case. Actually, it was the first case I was assigned to when I worked in the division, which at the time didn't look promising, which is probably why it was given to me. But ultimately, it became one of my most prominent cases um, within the DOJ, which was the investigation into the art auction houses, Christie's and Sotheby's that led to um, the trial of its Sotheby's former chairman of the board. And it was just a great experience from investigation through trial, through appeal. And it was really my way of learning criminal antitrust in a way that I probably would not have learned um, had I not had that opportunity. Wow. Wow. It's very uh, good. And you spoke mm -hmm. tips, you joined Bar Association, finding a suitable mentor, and having been working in the public sector throughout your career, could you describe the current work environment and the career events opportunities for uh, minority, anti minority women as an antitrust trial lawyer? Well, as you know, I left the antitrust division some years ago, but I do keep up with the the current trends. And I do speak with my former colleagues and coworkers and those who are in the division and were with the division. The antitrust division of today is completely different than the division when I joined um, in a way that it's, I feel is more impactful and, and more prominent. And it really started with younger leadership that came, that joined um, probably about midway through my career um, with the division. And and it really came to a head when you had leadership who really wanted to hear the issues that were um, articulated by minority attorneys division wide. And we were, at, for, at first we were given mentors, which we did not have before, and we were able to communicate with each other. And I really learned and met other attorneys of color throughout the division. And actually, when I spoke to the leadership in the, in, in the D.C. office, the first thing they did was connect me to another Black woman who, was a, um, who worked in the division longer than I did. So we became very close over the years, and we still talk from time to time. Um, also, in the antitrust division, when President Obama um, was in the White House, they really made a push at diversity um, at the attorney level and really created the first division-wide uh, diversity committee, which I was, um, I was asked to join. And I spent many years developing the affinity groups that are in place today, um, developing training opportunities for attorneys of color, just to give us the space to engage in understanding what the antitrust laws are, and particularly in the criminal and, and civil context, and really give us the opportunity, the, the means to communicate and really ask those dumb questions that you, you may not necessarily feel uncomfortable um, asking someone who's senior and someone who's white. And for me, uh, to, even now, I mentor um, young antitrust attorneys, uh, those who know of me will reach out to me and ask questions about my experience with my trust um, space and, and how to navigate it. And I wish I knew someone like myself when I was started out, it would have definitely helped me um, probably move, um, navigate the space much faster. Wow, it's so important to have like a, 
uh, predecessor guiding us. Yeah. So um, that's how, yeah, that's the, what Barbara mentioned about paying it forward. It, it absolutely is important. Oh, yeah. So how do minority women and the antitrust lawyers in the public sector seek resources and help and support? I mean, for example, in your uh, current organization. Well, it, it's, it's unfortunate that the antitrust division, antitrust as a whole doesn't really attract a large number of minority attorneys, particularly women attorneys. I mean, I can, as an antidote, I learned about antitrust through uh, a mentorship program um, from college. My mentor was a white male at the time, was an associate at Sullivan and Cromwell, and he was practicing antitrust. And he spent the better part of his day teaching the antitrust law. And I was a college student and I said to him jokingly, well, I'm going to practice antitrust and I'm going to work for the good guys, i.e. the government. Fast forward maybe six plus years later, when I work, interned for a federal judge in D.C., um, Judge Christine Odell Cook Miller, she mentioned the honors program. And that was really the first I learned of the honors program. And when I saw antitrust as the um, one of the participating agencies, I just jumped at the chance. Um, I definitely think um, the resources for us is to really start by getting the word out, letting people know that there are people of color who practice anti-law. And I think that's a big challenge that when I was on the antitrust committee, we noted that really getting people who are interested in prosecutorial work, recognizing that if you want to be a prosecutor, the DA's office is not the only route. You could be a federal prosecutor straight out of law school in many instances, particularly antitrust, which is most, which is white collar exclusively. So getting the word out has always been um, something that we at least I have been advocating for many years. Um, I think for resources wise, how do you advance? How do you get support? Absolutely, as I said before, finding mentors. And for me, that was very important to find mentors that I feel comfortable enough to kind of have those discussions, particularly when you have the setbacks. Um, not to go into a long story, but I remember having a particularly difficult setback and the person I reached out to for advice was Barbara. And Barbara gave me the advice that you, you kind of heard um, as she spoke and it really helped me understand um, that I needed to make decisions about my future career and really gave me the opportunity gave me the thought to come up with a strategic plan, which is the reason why I'm currently the deputy chief, virtual currency chief here at DFS. Uh, another resource is really developing and finding affinity groups. And that's so important. Again, when I started in the division, there really wasn't an, an affinity group. Now it, it's just robust with affinity groups, DOJ wide, not just division wide, uh, not just for, um, people of color, Black women, Latinx um, attorneys, um, LGBTQ+. It, it's just amazing to see the affinity groups that are in place today. And, and those help. Those absolutely help because it really gives you that kindred spirit connection. And it does help offset the imposter syndrome that sometimes ruminate in our minds, thinking that you're just here because you're a flu, particularly when you walk into a space, a white space, and you realize you're the only, you know, black dot in the sea of, of white. And you ask yourself, do I deserve to be here? Was I qualified enough to be here? And when you don't see attorneys of color that even come close to resembling you it really it, it it's really challenging to overcome those um, thoughts those internal dialogues that we have on a constant basis uh, another resource is building relationships and i'll tell you i've built mentor relationships even non-mentor relationships i'm um, not just within the in a hat the mentorship should be diverse my mentors are not just um, people of color are also white people. Um, Barbara being one, um, that it's always important to have people who's going to sponsor you. It's usually white people that's going to be sponsoring you in, in the rooms when you're not there. And that's important. Um, Barbara noted as well about writing papers. Um, it's one of the challenges in working for the government because there's just so many checks that you have to go through in order to write, which makes it a little challenging. Um, but I think for me, I really make it a point to try to write things, uh, short blurbs on LinkedIn, which is not 
doesn't have to go through the, the usual rigor. And I focus um, on antitrust issues because as I mentioned earlier, I still like, I still want to keep in touch with um, the antitrust, antitrust trends. Oh, thank you so much, Deborah, for sharing your personal experience and uh, your career trajectory. So um, just want to ask you both, like uh, Barbara and Deborah, do you have actually like a final career advice for women uh, and minority women who want to succeed as uh, antitrust uh, trial lawyers? So, so Barbara, do you have any final career advice? Yes, I do. And it, it's interesting listening to Deborah because I would never have thought that she uh, was touched by any of my words or uh, deeds along the way. And it, it um, is actually quite emotional for me to hear that. Um, and it makes me think about, um, I, I happen to have a 20 year old daughter who's a college student. And along the way, she has told me that um, some of her friends um, have looked to me as a role model uh, in terms of what they want to do career-wise. And I am reluctant to say that out loud um, because I think it sounds egomaniacal, but my point is to say that women in leadership is not an issue that is over or um, a fait accompli that we can take leadership. Women in leadership feel isolated, but we must keep stepping forward and we must be there for one another. And the women that are trying to step forward need to realize that if they are faking it or they feel they're faking it, go ahead and do it with aplomb and confidence because you are a role model for others. So you, we all have a responsibility one to each other as women to set the agenda and to be dignified and to be prepared and to go forward confidently. And the thing that is true for men and for women as we step forward is actually nobody else is that vested in our success. So we can start to feel self-pity that other people are not backing us up, but they may also feel that they are not backed up. So you need to cultivate that with each other and you need to trust people wisely, ideally women, and you need to pay it forward. But women are watching one another. I had no idea that Deborah sometimes looked to me or thought, of how I handled things. I um, had no idea that I had given her advice. I can't recall the conversation, to be honest with you, but clearly we are impactful one to another. I listen to younger women now who I feel speak with much fewer apologies and are much bolder in their assertions of opinions. And sometimes I am uncomfortable about the way in which they are very direct and then I check myself because I just think, you go, you just go and you do that and don't apologize. And I am trying to learn from my younger women peers in a way of not being apologetic for feeling uh, what I believe strongly. And so we are watching one another. We can help one another we can emulate one another and we can lead, but you don't lead alone and you don't need to lead alone. You need to have allies. And um, I just, uh, I want people to, women to step into the fray. I want women and minorities to be given opportunities and to seize them. And I am lifted by this conversation myself to carry on another day. I'm lifted by the fact that you asked me to speak to these questions. And I'm of course lifted by my friend, Deborah, who um, is such an inspiration to me. I do understand the idea of being um, alone in a room as a woman. Um, I have faced that situation sometimes uh, earlier, more often in my career, but still today I'm often the only woman in a room and for it to be also true to be the only woman and minority, it's a lot. And um, 
people will be blind to it. Um, and when you get put down or somebody thinks your idea is dumb, it can be very tempting to curl up in a ball and to um, retreat and to uh, buy into their view of what you've said or what you've done. And you need to carry on and you need to then uh, go to your resources, go to your people that have your back and then carry on and um, don't let somebody else define you down. You are the champion of your own career and you need to, you need to recognize that no investment that you'll ever make stock market, real estate or anything is as big an investment as your career and your well-being, your whole life well-being and your career. Those are your biggest assets. That's your life. Grab it, cultivate it, and cherish it, and um, and cherish those of other women and minorities. And um, we're all we're all stronger together. And I I believe that to my core, and I try to live that. So um, thank you so much, Deborah, for your generous remarks. Thank you so much, Barbara, too, for a. Uh yeah, I just agree. Should be proud of like being the only woman in the conference room. Yeah, and Deborah, do you have like a final career advice to uh, women? My yes, uh, you know, as I think about it, there's just so many pieces of advice. If, but I, I, I put it in the context of if I today can talk to myself when I first started, and my younger self would actually listen, what would I tell myself? I think the first thing I would tell myself right away is a piece of advice I recently heard from someone who I, you know, when you hear pearls of wisdom and it kind of is awestruck, I, I live by this motto now and, and the advice that I heard, and I, I wish I could recall where I heard it from so I can give this person a proper attribution, but this person said, your opinion of me is none of my business. And I just thought that was a beautiful statement in the sense that I took seriously what other people thought of me. And it really could drain you emotionally. It can drain you physically. It could just drain you everywhere. And when I heard this advice, I recognized that, yes, that it, there is a, some truth to that. So now I live my truth and my opinion of me is all that matters. Um, also maybe my husband, but definitely me. Uh, another piece of advice I would tell myself, um, a younger, my younger self is you don't have to be self-deprecating to make others feel better. And this was a piece of advice I can attribute to my husband who overheard me in a meeting the other day. And I, I wasn't even conscious of it, but he, no, he brought to my attention that, you know, you don't have to self be self-deprecating in order to make your point. And he's right. So now I go into these calls and these are mostly remote. All of my meetings are now remote meetings. Uh, I come in not doing that. And I'm, I'm now being conscious of not belittling, belittling myself in a way that makes me feel or gives the impression that I don't know what I'm talking about, which is far from the truth. I'm smart, I'm confident. I've been practicing law for over 20 years. And if I was any, if I couldn't practice law, I still wouldn't be practicing law. Um, but talking to antitrust specifically, I recently read that at least as far back as, or not as far back as October of 2020, black attorneys comprise of less than 3% of all division attorneys. And the numbers are even smaller in leadership positions. But succeeding in antitrust and the antitrust division is not impossible. Um, it, for me, to stay in antitrust and antitrust division for as long as I have was out of my love for antitrust, my desire to protect the little guy, and even a, a sense of patriotism that was strong enough for me to stay in this agency for as long as I have. I was there for, for almost 15 years. I Again, if I could talk to my younger self, and even in talking to young antitrust attorneys, I would actually consider and suggesting leaving the division. Um, it, it's, a, it's a tough decision. I will not, it's hard, it's probably even be controversial in nature. I think 
consider leaving the, the division may help build skills that you may not necessarily get uh, or develop while in division, working in another government agency or going into a firm or in-house for a few years. Uh, believe it or not, the division does have a soft spot for former attorneys returning to the fold. It happens <laughs> more times than you think. Uh, I, I mean, I wish I, I mean, I left the division. Um, would I consider going back? Um, I, I think so. I mean, I still love antitrust. I still keep up with the antitrust trends. And I feel I can, even though I'm working in the virtual currency space, I'm sure I can fold that in somehow into antitrust. Uh, but one of the last pieces of advice um, I would give myself is to really find a diverse array of colleagues, both inside and outside the division, who will mentor you, who will sponsor you, and, and who will guide you in supporting your career goals, whatever that may be. I, it's been very helpful for me to, when, as I navigated um, through my space and how to, what to do next after division life, and now really loving what I'm doing now in virtual currency and, and understanding and, and really building that skill, that my love of virtual currency could not have happened were it not for my love of antitrust. I feel one would not have happened it without the other. Uh, be vigilant and, and, also, and almost always enjoy antitrust law. It's kind of a, an odd piece of advice, but oftentimes when you read antitrust, you, you may yawn, but I, I don't yawn. I, I love reading the trends. I love understanding the nuances and, and just enjoy um, what you do and never be afraid to ask for help. I wish I told myself, my younger self that. And I thank you for allowing me to speak this morning and, and thank you, Barbara, for inviting me. Well, thank you so much, both speakers, and uh, we look forward to uh, listen more uh, if we have time to talk about uh, other aspects of your career life. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Trust and Trade, brought to you as always by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Now you know that's the tea.